to me. Okay, cool. So um, I want to welcome everybody to the uh, 2020 launch of the Canadian Landscape Countdown Policy Brief. And we're super lucky because we're also going to get to um, have uh, a presentation on the Doctors Without Borders Global Health Policy Brief uh, from uh, Carol Devine, which is a last minute surprise. So I'm here on um, Chief Draghi's territory. So this is the traditional land of the North Slave Métis and the traditional territory of the Yellowknives Dene. And I just want to extend uh, my acknowledgement uh, that we are on the uh, territories, uh, each of us in our different part of Canada, of Canada's in, of the Indigenous people of Canada, and to give thanks uh, for this land on which we work, live, and play. And I want to uh, extend a particular welcome to Dr. Deborah McGregor, who is a uh, is Ashanabe, an associate professor and Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Environmental Justice at York University. She was a integral part of this year's um, Canada Brief, and uh, Dr. Petrin de Rosier and Dr. Fanola Hackett have uh, told us that uh, she really. Um, uh, made invaluable input into making sure that the brief uh, was appropriate and uh, helpful and it's uh, the way it addressed Indigenous issues and equity issues. So welcome Dr. McGregor, it's a real pleasure to, uh, pleasure to meet you. Um, I'll then introduce uh, Carol Devine. She is uh, one of the climate leads at uh, MSF Canada and has really led uh, the Doctors Without Borders Médecins Sans Frontières uh, initiatives around climate change and health internationally over the last how many years now, Catherine or Carol? Three, four? It's been a while. Yeah, without her, uh, MSF wouldn't be nearly uh, where it is today. And uh, coming then to the co-authors of this brief, uh, Dr. Claudelle Petrin de Rosier, who's currently uh, doing her master's in public health, environmental health, uh, a well-decorated uh, young physician who recently won the inaugural uh, Canadian Medical Association Award for Young Leaders, the Brian Brody Award, and Dr. Fanola Hackett, who is, uh, you've just graduated, right, from, res from residency now? I still have six months to go. Six months to go and has been an incredible leader also internationally um, in terms particularly of medical education on climate change and health. So we're now at the point where uh, I get I get emails about that and I say, here, talk to Finola. And it's great to have all of these uh, young physicians coming up and into their own. And finally, and our first speaker will be Dr. Ann Collins, who is uh, the Canadian Medical Association president. And we're absolutely delighted to have her here today. The CMA um, helped to sponsor this brief and promote it. And as a Canadian Medical Association board member, in addition to my role uh, with CAPE as its past president, now I have to say I'm really, really proud of the CMA uh, for the work that uh, we're doing on climate change. So Dr. Colin, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thanks very much, Courtney, for that introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am very happy to be joining you this evening on behalf of the Canadian Medical Association. And I'm coming to you from Fredericton, New Brunswick, and I'm sitting on the unceded territory of the Wallistiqua people or Maliseet people. First, let me thank Drs. Claudel Petrin de Rosier and Fanola Hackett for their great work on the groundbreaking Lancet study we are here to discuss and for your efforts to draw attention to the important relationship between climate change and health. And before I go any further, I also wanna take the opportunity to congratulate you, Dr. P Petrin de Rosier, on having recently been awarded the CMA Dr. Brian Brody Medical Learner Leadership Award for your leadership in this field. This is the fourth consecutive year the CMA has supported the Canadian findings of the Lancet Countdown as part of our ongoing commitment to highlight the links between climate change and health and to call on governments to take action, recognizing that climate change is a global issue. There is no doubt that climate change is a huge threat to human health and there are connections that are particularly relevant for physicians in the healthcare system. Working in collaboration with the World Health Organization, we recently conducted a survey of our membership. It confirmed that physicians are seeing firsthand the health impacts of climate change on their patients. 
For example, members shared concerns over heat-related illnesses, illnesses, physical and mental harm from storms, floods, droughts, and forest or bushfires, illnesses due to reduced outdoor air quality, and the prevalence of anxiety, depression, and other mental health conditions. More than 75% of respondents believe these health issues among their patients will become more frequent or intense over the next 10 years. 85% of respondents strongly or somewhat agree that health professionals have a responsibility to bring the health effects of climate change to the attention of policymakers and the public. That is advocacy work we're proud of, that we are proud to be engaged in. These survey results will be provided to the WHO, who will be putting together a comparison of healthcare professionals' views from around the world to be published a few weeks from now. Further, we must recognize that Canada's healthcare sector is contributing to this problem. Our healthcare system accounts for approximately 5% of our country's annual greenhouse gas emissions, which is a larger proportion than in many other countries. As physicians, we must be leaders in taking action within our own sector. The CMA is engaged in scoping conversations with external stakeholders as we move forward in our efforts to address this issue. That includes working with the British Medical Association, a leader in this effort, on best practices for greening the healthcare system. The CMA has been active on a number of other fronts. We advocate it for political commitments to address the link between climate change and health during last year's federal election campaign. We provided our support on a letter written by the Global Climate and Health Alliance sent to G20 leaders, encouraged them to pursue a healthy recovery to the COVID-19 pandemic. We were a signatory to CAPE's healthy recovery plan for a safe and sustainable future. And along with CAPE and other organizations, we participated at COP25 in Madrid. There, we emphasized the need for health impacts to be considered in climate negotiations and to encourage other countries to make stronger emission reduction commitments to help mitigate the impact on their citizens' health. Further on the international front, we also call for climate change to be recognized not only as a health issue, but as, as an equity issue. We know that the populations experiencing the worst impacts of climate change are often those who have least contributed to causing it. Let me close by expressing my appreciation for the work that CAPE is doing and for the commitment of everyone here to taking action on an issue that is not just about making a better future, but whether there will be a better future. The CMA stands with you in addressing this matter of profound importance to the health of Canadians and indeed to the health of everyone around the world. Thank you, Merci Miigwech, and I look forward to the presentations tonight as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Collins. And I must say, I was so proud last year uh, when we were at COP and uh, Dr. Osler, as CMA president, gave a keynote actually at the World Health Organization um, Global Health Alliance um, a meeting as really the only uh, medical association president to be in attendance. So I think we're really, really well positioned knowing that the NHS has uh, now committed to reaching net zero uh, as a um, organization by 2040. And uh, someone that uh, Dr. Petrin de Rosier and I know uh, well, uh, Nick Watts, um, smartest guy I've ever worked with, uh, they put him in charge. So I think uh, we can expect blazing uh, results there. And if we stay in good contact with them, I think that uh, we will make some good progress. So lots, lots of uh, really good things going on. Well, I will now turn the uh, presentation over to our two co-authors, uh, Dr. Hackett and Dr. Petrin de Rosier, uh, two just outstanding young physicians uh, whose work uh, is something we can all be proud of and who really give me a tremendous amount of uh, energy and who are extremely inspiring in uh, the work that they're bringing to this on behalf of us all. So go for it, uh, Claudel and uh, Finola. 
Thanks. Um, thanks, Courtney. You, uh, I think we, we've asked Courtney to, uh, to be with us tonight. Um, she, she's written the last uh, brief of the Lancet Countdown on Canada for the last three years. And um, she, she reached out this year and asked if we could do it. And it was quite an honor. And I'm very, very happy um, to, to, to have been able to do this work. And um, there's a lot that we're thankful, uh, thankful for, uh, Courtney. Uh, you bring a lot of energy and, and smartness to this place. And um, yeah, I just I just want to state that I'm your work is is highly appreciated, and uh, I think we should recognize what you've done for for this space in Canada and internationally. I have to say, um, I'll just I'll just share my screen and then we'll get started. While I do, um, you know, I'm not sure if you want to. Hmm. Yeah, I'll let you set up that. I'll introduce myself a little bit and then turn it back over to Claudel. Um, so I am a second year resident in the Family Medicine University of Calgary program in the rural program um, based out of Lethbridge in southern Alberta and currently working in, in High River, which is just south of Calgary. I got involved because I actually did my bachelor's degree majoring in environment at McGill University. Um, did a little bit of work at WHO in the Public Health and Environment Department prior to med school um, and an internship in China on sustainable food. Um, and found the National CFMS Heart Environmental Task Force when I was a med student as a way to continue these inter interests in the intersection between health and the environment. And through that work on curriculum and, and changing medical education on this topic, I got to know Courtney and Claudel and many other um, inspiring folks. So it was an honor to work with them, uh, work with Claudel especially, um, as well as Deb over the last several months to, to write this brief. I'll let Claudel introduce herself and then the um, start our presentation. Yeah, thanks. Um, Courtney did a, a good job at, at the um, earlier in the presentation to summarize uh, who I am and what I do. Um, I'm I'm still a family medicine resident, but I'm based in Montreal. Um, and um, just just uh, we we've done this webinar in English, but um, obviously, as you can hear, this is not my mother tongue. I speak French. A bit better than I do speak English, but if there's anyone here um, eventually is willing to ask question in French, uh, please do so. We'll be happy to answer in French. Um, or if there's anything you want us to, uh, we, we want. We it was hard to offer sort of live translation, but if there's anything you want us to um, to do in French, just let us know, and I'll be happy to. Um, I'm um, so I'm, I'm a final year medical uh, resident in family medicine. I'm currently in a scholar uh, program, which allows me to do a master in environment and sustainable development at UDM. And uh, have, I have been involved in this space for the last eight, nine years, I think. Um, I've, I've worked with the WHO and I work with the International Federation of Medical Students Association. And um, recently in Montreal, last uh, August, 2018, we organized a first international medical student conference, which was carbon neutral. And we did publish, it, um, we did publish about it in the Lancet. Um, and um, so this is my first year working on the brief, um, but last year I was a bit involved in the um, in speaking about it to the media. Um, and I'm currently on the, the Quebec president of the uh, Quebec president of the chapter here uh, of Cape. Um, so that, without further ado, we'll uh, we'll jump in into presenting our brief. We have about you know 10, 15 minutes presentation, and then um, it will be followed by some. Uh, comments and inside from from Deborah who's uh, who's collaborated a lot with us on this brief and then uh, as Courtney mentioned uh, we'll flip over to Carol and then uh, we'll take any question towards the end um, so feel free to ask at any time but we'll most likely answer um, toward the end. Um, just to maybe a bit of background on, on what the Lancet I guess most of you in the, if you are in the medical field um, you know that the Lancet is one of the world most renowned medical journal. Um, They've released the first um, paper on climate change and health in 2009, calling climate change a greatest threat to health of the century. Um, and the WHO has agreed on, on this statement in 2018. Um, in 2015, the Lancet launched a second report on the health impacts of climate change. And instead of not only calling in the greatest threat to health, they also said, well, you know, this could be a greatest opportunity to improve health around the world. So we'll sort of start to track progress on climate change and health. So since 2016, every year, they released a huge report, which makes about 40 pages long, quite complicated. But what's to be understanding is that they follow around eight, 40 indicators 
um, from economics to media engagement, policy makers, um, health adaptation, mitigation um, regarding this climate change and health. And I think, you know, this is sort of the best data that we've got. Everything is available on their website. Um, as we are not sort of authors on the, the international report, uh, Finola and I are not able to talk about it as much as we're able to talk about the Canadian brief. Um, and just to sort of understand is the lens that aims to change international policy regarding climate change and health to make sure that we have a healthy future. Um, so there's a couple of countries around the world that do write briefs um, and targeting specifically policymaker in their own country. So we've done it in Canada and this is a fourth brief. Um, and so th this is why there is a specific policy angle to, 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 to how we've presented the data. Um, the, the WHO is obviously in support of, of, of the Lancet work um, and said that the Lancet countdown on health and climate change uh, is an essential partner in driving the global progress towards achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement, uh, which has been described as the most important health treaty of the century. Um, so if you have a chance to read the Lancet report, I would recommend it's a 40 page, but it's well, uh, it's a time well invested to better understand um, how climate is shaping our health. Um, before we go further, I'm going to stop sharing my, sh my screen a second to share it again. Um, the Lancet has developed this year um, a series of video, and I wanted to show one quickly. Um, it's from the US, but I think it, um, it, it resonates well for Canada. And this is from uh, René Salas, an ER doc in, in the Boston area, which is doing tremendous work in the US despite a maybe hostile environment, but she's publishing a lot, especially in the New England Journal of Medicine and truly is a leader. And she, she wrote the, um, the US Lancet, Lancet brief this year, um, but she, she's speaking a bit about what she's seeing in the ER. So I think it's worth um, listening for a couple of minutes. My name is Renee Salas and I'm an emergency medicine physician and climate change and health researcher in Boston, Massachusetts in the United States. This pandemic has shown us that when we ignore the science and fail to act, that people get harmed and die. When a patient is sick, I can't take that one illness in isolation. I always have to think about everything else that's going on within the body. And the same is true for climate change because so many of the other challenges that are facing our society today are interconnected and intertwined. But that also means that the solutions and the opportunities are also intertwined. Climate change is also causing pollen levels to be higher. And this is especially concerning for patients with underlying lung diseases like asthma. There was a four-year-old girl that I saw on an overnight shift. It was her third visit that week for an asthma attack. And she was struggling to breathe as we gave her breathing treatments to try to open up her lung passages. Her mother, understandably, was extremely concerned and felt helpless about how she could help protect her daughter. And so I sat and talked to them about how climate change was increasing pollen levels, which was a key factor in why her daughter was struggling to keep her disease under control. The mother felt empowered by knowing ways in which that she could limit her daughter's exposure to pollen, but also how she could get to the root cause of climate change in order to stop the downstream pathways that were harming her daughter. So many of my patients, I feel like I'm putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound because I can try to stabilize their diseases, but then I send them back out into the world where they are continually exposed to the ways in which climate change is harming their health. We have to get to the root cause of the problem. All right, I'll share my screen again. <laughs> um, I just I just need a second to close that tab, sorry. Um, and we'll drive into the, uh, the this year report. Um, give me just a second, sorry about this. All right. We should. All right, here we go. Finola, floor is yours. Uh, yeah, I think that um, that was a great little succinct summary. Um, so the global report, which again we didn't write, but which this report kind of fits in with, 
talks about how COVID has really shown us the um, impacts when we ignore the science, just as Dr. Salas was saying, but um, talking about solutions and opportunities and how they're intertwined. I think that's the biggest thing that I have taken from this work in the last few months from the global findings and from our Canada findings is that it's very solutions oriented and doom and gloom gives doesn't give people enough hope. So we'll talk a bit about solutions and, and what we all potentially can do as healthcare um, professionals and as leaders and as people concerned about, about health in our country. As no country remains immune, and we see that in, in Canada's report that we are not immune to this, um, and that there are certain groups that are potentially at higher risk um, that we talk about. Um, but it's not just talking about these risks, it's including these groups in the solutions to the pandemic and to climate change. Again, we're not trying to paint groups as victims, but it's really about directly including and prioritizing the input of those groups most affected when we address these crises. Um, and I think COVID is a stressor that is showing stresses and burdens on our healthcare system. And what we see globally is that um, health systems are at their breaking point and that this is a little bit of a preview of what could happen in the next 5, 10, 20 years as we see increasingly severe extreme weather events, um, displacement of people, extreme heat, wildfires, pollution. So even though these might be more insidious risks, it's still going to put a similar strain as a, as a potential pandemic and so we need to prepare our health systems. So moving on to the next slide. Um, these are a couple of the Lancet global infographics that were shared. There's about 10, 10 of them um, you can see on their website. And these are a couple that I thought were relevant for Canada. No country being immune. And we talk about extreme heat in the first section of a report, which Claudel is about to talk about. And this is having both a um, um, human impact, but also an econo economic impact around the world and in Canada in terms of, of working hours lost. So we'll move on to the Canada report now. All right. Um, so we, um, when when we got the task <laughs> to write the report, we we asked ourselves, you know, what what is important for Canada? What is shaping today's Canada health? And um, we we focused the brief on on three main um, section um, or areas. One is extreme heat. Um, the second one is air pollution, and the third one is addressing the convergence crisis, converging crisis that is climate change and COVID nineteen. Um, just before we, we continue, um, there's people who help us uh, written this brief that are not necessarily with us tonight, but I just want to make sure that we, we thank them for their work. And I, I want to thank uh, Krista Banaziak uh, from the CMA, um, Deborah, who's with us tonight, who <laughs> will talk a bit about her, her own perspective, um, and people who've uh, who revised the document for us, uh, with, with us, and uh, that is Céline Campagna, who's working with the um, National Public Health, Health Institute of Quebec, and uh, Dr. Bob Woolard, probably a lot of you know from his work in social accountability. Um, and so, and Jessica Bigley was the um, policy manager at the, at the Lancet. Um, they, they, they are some of the minds behind this brief. So we have not done this alone, Finola and I, but um, those people were, were really helpful. Um, we, there's a total of six recommendations. We were given the task to write four, but you know, there's too many solutions. So we went with six um, that are relevant to Canada. Um, and obviously one of the things that was really important, and I think Finola highlighted that very well or a few minutes ago, but um, there's, you know, the COVID-19 is exacerbate um, many existing inequalities um, and we've seen them more than ever. So it was very important for us that we address that in our brief and we make sure that whatever we, we recommend or write would have this sort of social equity and justice lens. Uh, we felt that it was very important, especially for people that are often either marginalized or more at risk um, and, you know, could be, uh, could play a central role in, in, in the solution and, and how we implement policy. So that's how the brief is, is divided. Um, and obviously we've worked with the, the indicators from the Lancet and the data that is presented in, in this brief is extracted from the sort of international pool of data provided and, and compiled by, by the Lancet. Um, so the, the first section um, is about heat and I, I won't do a literature review of the impacts of heat on, on, on a body. Um, we've done, we've tried to summarize it all in a nice infographic that is, I know a bit small in this presentation, but you'll find it bigger in, in, our, in our brief per se. Uh, but 
it highlights that you know heat just put an enormous stress on the body um, and it impacts a lot of systems including our brain and our mental health um, it has been linked to an increase in all-cause mortality um, and change in activity level. Um, it impacts the kidneys. Um, it can lead to dehydration. Um, so really heat is, is a stressor. Um, and there are several studies that sort of show that when it's extremely hot during the summer, there tend to be an increase in, in criminality and, and violence, sometimes directed toward women. So um, we've highlighted that in the brief just to show that it's not because Canada is, you know, a Nordic country, country that we are immune to the, um, to the impact of extreme heat and global warming in our communities. Um, so what's the new data from this year uh, report? Um, so we were showing that there's a 58% increase in heat related mortality for population over 65 years old um, since uh, to the early 2000s. Um, surprisingly, that is a bit above the world average of 53%. Um, and in 2018, it resulted in uh, 2,700 premature heat related deaths again, for that same population of people over 65. Um, it's been more and more studied that um, as we age, we tend to sort of lose our natural ability to cope with, with heat. Um, and it's also sort of given the fact that as we tend to age, we also um, usually have some precondition or, or pre-existing diseases um, that put us at risk. Um, and medication are also sometimes can play a, a vital role in our, nat our body response to heat. Um, heat has also affect, impacted our capacity to work. Uh, we're showing that there's been around, on average, 7.1 million work hours lost due to extreme heat. Um, that's the, sort of the baseline, compared to the baseline of, um, I think it was 1995, um, that is 81% higher than the, bas the baseline. Um, and that sort of in terms of economics, um, that represent about 0.7% of our GNI, which might not seem a lot, but it's a lot compared to the 0.2% that it did represent uh, 20 years ago. Um, and there's also a section, we, we made sure that we, we sort of highlight the importance of natural built and social infrastructures in our response to, to heat. Um, and so that sort of shaped our recommendation um, regarding this section. So um, just gonna go over them quickly. And obviously for the second one, I'll, I'll let Deborah speak about it because she, she was crucial in, in shaping that policy and recommendation. And she will be far better than I am to sort of actually speak about it and, and, and tell us what it represents for, for indigenous communities. Um, but one thing that we felt it was important was to make sure that you know it's good to, to build new buildings that are that respect eco standards, but it's also very important to make sure that our old buildings also get a bit of attention um, and that we retrofit um, those built infrastructure to make sure that we reduce their um, carbon um, footprint, um, but also make sure that they are more energy efficient. Um, and you know, by it's a bit broad, but um, we have a lot of communities currently that are lacking a green canopy, or that we're not at an optimal level of of, of greenness, if I can say it that way, in, in our city. Um, and we there, there's work um, being done all over Canada regarding this, but um, it's important to know that we haven't spent as much money and and um, and time in greening our, our urban environment to sort of make sure that we improve our resilience to heat and especially for people at risk. Um, we know there's a there's a link. Um, richer communities tend to have more green trees uh, compared to low income um, communities. So obviously it just sort of adds a layer of, of disparities and inequity. Um, so that's a bit of the recommended um, our sort of analysis and, and recommendation for for heat in Canada. Um, and I'll turn out to uh, turn this off to Finola. Thanks, Claudel. So our second section focuses on air pollution um, and the new Lancet data on that for this or for um, for 2018 specifically show that related to PM 2.5, which is one specific type of air pollution. So I just want to emphasize that is what um, the Lancet data are on um, fine particulate matter related air pollution deaths. And that is estimated at over 8,000 of which um, the majority is from human causes. There's just 1,200 from what, what's called natural causes. So over 7,000 deaths from human caused pollution, um, specifically PM 2.5. If you look at Statistics Canada data, 
for that same year, it's closer to 15,000, about twice the numbers, 14,600 deaths related to air pollution by their measure. And that's because that's including other types of air pollution, such as ground level ozone or nitrous oxides and other forms of pollution that affect health. So just to give you an idea that there is other types of pollutions and that the impact can even be greater. Um, in terms of the Lancet data, um, it, it does break it down by sectors responsible for the proportion of of uh, uh, PM 2.5 pollution, um, the biggest being in the household sector. So that's energy use for heating, cooling, those types of things. Um, and then one of the other major sectors being transport. And we highlight these for our recommendations and solutions. Um, the Lancet data also show that while we've had good increases in the use of electricity for transport in Canada, it's still but a small drop in the bucket in terms of our overall energy use for tra transport, um, over 95% of uh, road transport in Canada is still fossil fuel based. And something we highlight is that integrating active tran travel, so that's biking, um, biking, walking, public transit, um, studies have shown that the cost benefit is about um, 10 to 11 to one. So that because of the significant um, reduction in, in health costs. So for every dollar you spend integrating some sustainable transport, specifically active travel measures in communities, um, you'll get $10 return on investment because of avoiding those preventable health outcomes. So I think that's a pretty significant argument to policymakers that this is something that would be both healthy and um, economic. So um, this is just one of the graphics in this section that highlights a comparison for the year 2018. Um, all of the PM 2.5 uh, deaths um, total is, uh, is about, yeah, four times the amount of um, deaths from road accidents that same year. Uh, of course, in the pre-COVID era, that was almost twice the deaths from um, all infectious diseases that year. And um, to move on to our solutions or recommendations, we focused on housing and transport um, as those are the sectors we wanted to highlight potential uh, solutions. Uh, and it is not that um, different from what we're suggesting with regards to extreme heat, um, because we, <clears throat> we can't knock down all of our buildings and transport systems and, and build it all from scratch. We need to design better, but we also need to redesign better and upgrade with a focus on community level activities and initiatives that are successful on the local, municipal, uh, regional level and supporting low emissions design that is actually tailored to those communities. Um, this is the most realistic way of doing it rather than um, top-down solutions, but, but for federal and provincial governments to support those local initiatives of which there are already many um, and providing funding that can support transport, especially in areas at risk of air pollution. So we find that low-income communities and certain groups um, are more at risk of air pollution's health effects. So targeting those communities and finding out what works for them and what initiatives will make their um, communities more sustainable and reduce pollution. Uh, so we can move on to our last section. So um, our final section, which we mentioned, focuses on what is a healthy recovery and what does that mean, both for climate and for COVID-19. Um, there's actually been enough data now um, throughout 2020 that we see that the lockdowns this year made barely a dent in our um, rise in, in emissions and total CO2 concentrations in, in the Earth's atmosphere. So really it hasn't changed that trajectory, um, but this is something that we need to address urgently. Um, and what is a just transition? What does that look like? Which groups are at risk? These are some of the ones at risk, not the, not the only ones. And it's not um, just identifying or, or acknowledging that, but include the people affected, prioritize those who ha have previously not had a voice and who are impacted by the pandemic and climate change. And that will give us the best solutions for all people in Canada. And um, we talk a little bit about the healthcare system. This was uh, highlighted in the 2019 Canada brief, so we don't go into as much detail here, but we know that Canada's healthcare system is responsible for about 5% of our total greenhouse gas emissions or one in 20, and that's pretty significant. Um, as healthcare professionals, we're often seen as leaders. And I think we do have a responsibility to take this challenge on and to help and make our health systems more resilient and sustainable, whether that's withstanding the shocks of climate change or um, of future 
uh, pandemics. So we see it as an opportunity. This pandemic is an opportunity to show that we can all come together collectively to promote health. And this is yet another uh, area of climate change in which we can do that. So I have a lot of hope. And that's something we emphasize in this section. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Claudel. Yeah, so this, this leads us to our final two recommendations. And obviously, the first one is aligned with with a recovery for, for COVID-19 um, being aligned with the just transition to a carbon neutral society, um, considering health and equity impacts um, of our policies um, and including directly and prioritizing the people that are disproportionately affected. And that includes, as we mentioned, indigenous people, women, racialized people, and those with low income. Um, we've, we've had this long discussion on how we, we should present this and how what would make a just transition. And one thing that we felt was very important to try to showcase was that you know, there are groups at risk, but they shouldn't be seen as victims. They should be seen as people who can be part of the solution and we, we could benefit from hearing more for what they their needs are and what they, they believe could work in their community. So there's a lot of, you know, there, there is a sense of collaboration um, regarding this. Government will will spend tons of money, um, which they haven't really spent since to in, in this economic recovery. And it's possible, like if we don't succeed this recovery, it might threaten the the chance of, of you know keeping the temperature below two degrees Celsius as suggested by by the Paris Agreement. So there's a lot at stake right now, but it's also, you know, we've seen movement of people, like people coming together asking for this. So we just want to sort of echoing what we've been hearing in societies and showing that, you know, as doctors, this is also our take in, in the recovery. And the, the second um, and well, the final recommendation that we make, and, and, and Courtney touched this in, in her introduction, but um, and, and Finola mentioned it, but healthcare is is a polluter, and I and we have a responsibility toward um, the transition as well. Um, and so we we want to strengthen health system resilience in space of climate change, um, and we see addressing climate change as a powerful way to reduce um, future health threats that communities may face. Um, and it's also the moment to sort of reduce our own footprint. Um, and you know, before we were told that this was a hard thing to do, uh, but now the NHS, the UK public health system, which shares a lot of similarities to Canada health system as being public and, and mostly managed by, by the government, uh, but they're leading this way, the, the way, and they, they've come in to, um, to reduce their emission close to zero by the next 20 years. Um, and the good thing is that they're actually sort of written a, big, a book about it and they're making every steps of their, of their uh, journey available for us to, to learn from. Um, so we have an example in the world of a health system that's doing this in the middle of a pandemic. And I think that's very inspiring and should um, should should lead us um, to our net zero health service here in Canada as well. Um, this is our final word. We just, um, Finola and I were very thankful that we were giving this opportunity to collaborate with, with the Lancet International um, team as well as just being able to speak and talk about it, uh, about the health impacts of climate change. We, you know, we, as doctors, we have a role to play in our clinics, but our role extend beyond, beyond that. And um, it's been, uh, it's been very fun. I mean, we'll continue to, to be those ducks around and say, you know, highlighting the importance of the environment for our health and how we should respond to it. Um, but we would just want to say thanks for, for allowing us to, um, to have that voice and, and to, uh, to be in this space. Um, so this is a few highlights of, of, of the media's interviews that we've done, but uh, shout out to F Finola who got up at 3.30 in the morning to do uh, 10 interviews in a row <laughs> for CBC syndication uh, next uh, last Thursday. Anyways, we'll end up with that um, and we'll leave the floor to, um, to Deborah. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you for that. Thank you for, for having me um, and that introduction. So I'm sitting in Toronto. I'm in Ishtabek, live and work in my own, uh, in my own territory. I just uh, wanted to acknowledge the uh, work of everyone who worked on this report. It, sometimes we had to have uh, uh, challenging conversations about uh, where the data was coming from, institutionalized and systemic um, inequity and and racism in Canada and how that plays out in, in climate uh, um, climate justice. But we managed to work through it and I think come out with um, 
uh, with work that I think reflects um, sort of the state of climate change and health in Canada and where we need to go, uh, go into the future. Um, ideally, since there's a lot of conversations happening around this uh, at this moment. So I think um, what I just wanted to just flesh out a little bit uh, of some remarks and I, I won't take long because I know we've got a number got, got more material to uh, to go through. So looking at looking at climate change through an equity and justice lens um, means, yeah, sometimes having to have a difficult um, conversation and also realizing that the solutions aren't necessarily going to be uh, aren't necessarily going to be simple and they inter interconnect with everything else that's um, that's going on. It interconnects with health. Um, when I think about, um, you know, the strengthening of um, health systems and understanding the impact of health, but we also have to strengthen um, ecosystems and biodiversity as well, because that goes hand in hand with, uh, with um, health of people, particularly people who are very close um, uh, with, uh, with the environment. Um, so I, I think what I wanted to do is just highlight, I think, uh, a tension that we are trying to uh, capture in the report around um, Indigenous peoples and how uh, just the everyday lived reality Indigenous peoples have in relation to, to climate change and, and the tensions that are kind of felt um, in that. So on the one hand, uh, Indigenous peoples um, are, you know, one of the vulnerable at-risk groups that experience climate change in uh, in very inequitable ways, but don't contribute a lot to the uh, to, to the problem. Um, and at the same time, a lot of that is because of the impact on the natural world or to the lands and resources that people um, depend on for a well-being and for their their livelihood. Um, but at the same time, those very same so they're you're impacted in a negative way because of that. And Every way, like your whole your whole way of life, not just your health, but everything, your governance, political systems, legal systems, um, and then at the same time, those very same systems that are vulnerable due to uh, resource development and sustainable human interactions with the natural world um, are the very same systems that help you build your resilience to the changes that are coming. So there's this tension that exists that's a constant negotiation for. Uh, for Indigenous peoples, and thus a lot of attention gets paid to um, public policy, and, and therefore the importance of a report like this to try to influence, um, try to influence those kind of um, processes. So at the same time, you're vulnerable, but at the same time, it also builds your resilience. So a lot of communities are in the process of trying to build resilience through land-based activities, um, particularly with um, with young people. I think the the other thing I, I wanted to highlight was that for a lot of Indigenous communities and probably for other people as well, for dealing with multiple crises. Not that long ago, we front page news was a community in Northern Ontario evacuated due to a water crisis. So Indigenous communities are dealing with multiple crises as well as climate. <laughs> so, and, and climate uh, exacerbates a lot of those um, conditions that, are, that exist in a lot of um, Indigenous communities. So on top of the water food crisis that indigenous peoples um, face on, on a daily basis is um, have also declared climate crisis in some of their communities. I think probably up in some of the area where, uh, where Courtney, um, Courtney works and lives and also um, last year through the assembly of first nations. And they're meeting right now and you know, trying to sort through some of the um, climate change uh, discussions. And, and again, from that front, also trying to influence uh, public policy in relation to um, in relation to climate change. So I think, um, so definitely it's like front and center, even if it's not, um, people fully experience it, but not necessarily, um, uh, I guess, connected always to, to climate change. And that, and that, and that's sort of reflected in in the in the bullet that um, that Finola talked about, and that's a lot of the climate change is an extension of the massive, dramatic environmental change that Indigenous peoples have experienced uh, since the colonization of Canada. So, so you'll have people who can relate to that dramatic environmental change, survive the environmental um, dramatic change, and are still here with Indigenous knowledge systems still intact to be able to share with others. So definitely Indigenous peoples feel they have something uh, important in terms of solutions to, um, to the contrib uh, contributions that they can make to policy um, and others. So I think that's, um, 
that's all I, I, I really wanted to, to, to say is that to try to, um, in terms of the Indigenous experiences, not to, um, is really trying to, I guess, think about it in a more integrated and holistic fashion. So typically, you know, how the response to climate change tends to be very siloed. So there's like risk, vulnerability, uh, mitigation, adaptation, resilience. So these are all sort of different silos of how people try to understand um, the experience of, of climate change on, on people or even on the, the natural world. Um, but Indigenous peoples in, a, in the lived experience experience those holistically. So when you're out on the land, you're also monitoring, you're also governing, you're also adapting, you're also building resilience. So it's, um, I think there's, um, there's something to be said for trying to understand those systems and how they can contribute to these um, discussions, even though there may not necessarily be, you know, the indicators to be able to show, because we haven't developed them yet, because we haven't thought about these in that way in order to be able to develop those kind of indicators that we can draw on uh, for future um, reference. So. I just want to do um, congratulate everyone who contributed to this report and really trying to apply a different lens to it, which I think um, it, by all accounts sounds like it, it was effective and hopefully we'll start to see those changes in, uh, in public policy and other areas and other aspects of society um, because of this really important work. So, Jimmy Gwetch. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. McGregor. And certainly it's been really wonderful over the last maybe even two to three years to see the increasing presence of indigenous voices within climate change and planetary health space. Um, some of the elders from up here, uh, Elder Bessa Blondin and uh, Rossi were at the Planetary Health Alliance Conference at Stanford about a year and a half ago now and brought the audience to tears. So that lived experience and that um, experience with uh, adaptation and also the storytelling culture, um, just I've seen be transformative um, for audiences. And so actually just recently, uh, I was on a call with um, the editor of The Lancet Planetary Health, Alistair Brown, um, as he was seeking to figure out how he could better include indigenous voices um, in his work at the journal, because of course it's always this intersection between, you know, traditional knowledge and that knowledge system and Western scientific knowledge systems. And so Nicole Redvers and uh, Margot Greenwood were sort of talking him through, walking him through how how better to do that. So I think it's a, a matter of, of uh, you know, real uh, spending the time with one another and really listening and, and seeing if we can, um, better integrate those conversations because I certainly know that Elder Francois Paulette and Bessa Blondin have been absolutely key to my work up here for a long time when doctors didn't want to hear about it I would come home and I'd be like am I like really is it just me should I stop doing this and they would say no keep going um, and so I think there's so much we can learn um, Speaking about, uh, there's we've been talking a lot about siloing and the importance to de-silo and to multi-solve. And one of the areas where um, you know multiple factors really come uh, to create a nexus of risk and opportunity is very much in the global health space. And so I'm going to ask uh, Carol Devine, who's been so much leading these efforts uh, for MSF, to uh, to present now about the global health brief. Thank you so much, Courtney. And I want to thank um, you all on the panel and Claudel for inviting me. Um, we only have a few minutes, so I'm going to take you just on a snapshot of MSF's uh, Doctors Without Borders brief. Um, I also want to acknowledge all of our co-authors um, co and peer reviewers. I'll be mentioning several of them. I'm just going to open up um, some pictures. Um, also, it was really interesting, um, Finola and Claudel and um, Deborah, to read your uh, the, I'll read the recommendations because there's a lot of echoes um, in in our our recommendations too. And just about you know Canada, I think what what I really want to highlight is the the you know I'm really I really um, appreciate what Deborah said about silos and um, integration and how we have to uh, you know talk with communities and understand the solutions in all of these these um, cases I'm going to share with you super briefly and and also just about Canada and the uh, absolute overlap of COVID and climate uh, on the surface or just under the surface it's not that it exposed um, racism and exposed um, exclusion 
But I think we, we just can't, no, we can no longer uh, ignore that. And I have to note that in Canada during COVID, MSF um, did some advocacy with Amnesty and um, the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network about the fact that um, everybody needs access to healthcare. And with the vaccine coming up, um, that's something we're gonna reiterate and reiterate. And when Canada closed the borders to um, uh, refugee claimants, it doesn't make sense. It, it, it um, breaks international law, it breaks national law and commitments, and also public health responses work to climate change, to COVID, to these cascading crises when everyone has access. So um, I, I, I want to reiterate that. So for indigenous communities and for, for vulnerable groups like migrant communities that we also see in Libya and in um, Mexico in this first slide, sorry, I'm gonna get to the um, quick slideshow. So our brief, um, what we tried to do, and, and I wanna thank um, Dr. Courtney Howard too, who has in the past worked for Médecins Sans Frontières and she really helped push MSF to apply a climate change lens. I wanna thank you, Courtney. You were, you peer reviewed our first one where we were trying to find our voice and say, we're not climate scientists, but we are 67,000 um, employees around the world. The majority of people who work for Médecins Sans Frontières, doctors, nurses, logisticians, um, community outreach people live in highly climate impacted countries. And um, so it's been, it's taken us a bit of time to understand how do we talk about this? And I think it as we want to share these experiences. Um, we're not the scientists, but we can contribute to policy. We can contribute to try to respond better. Um, this image um, is from our introductory piece by Carolyn Voot and um, Dr. Maria Govera. And it's one of the 52 uh, migrant shelters we work in, in in Mexico. And of course, already extremely vulnerable people now um, also grappling with, with COVID. And why are people, why are people fleeing and in these shelters? We have we want to say too, we understand it's because of violence and the history there, but it's also because people tell us their um, crops are failing and there's no water. Um, so what we share is that um, COVID and uh, COVID and the climate crisis have, of course, common causes, but also common solutions. And really, it's a harbinger for us. It's a, um, it's a dress rehearsal for what could be a more lethal pandemic and um, the climate crisis. So like was shared um, about the Canadian brief, it also is absolutely an opportunity. And um, some of the mitigation work we've talked about are reducing our negative environmental impact through our medical work. Um, you know, that's, it's been, it's been terrible. There's been so much loss, but it also tells us um, we can do it and um, we can, we have to build back better. So um, Dr. Maria Guevara um, has really helped with MSF to apply this climate change, uh, sort of this planetary health lens into our humanitarian work. So the kind of pillars are, how are we going, and I, I'm sorry, I'm using these common terms, but how are we gonna adapt what we do, um, putting on this climate and planetary health lens how are we going to speak about it? Um, because Doctors Without Borders has this dual mandate to give needs-based humanitarian medical assistance to talk about it. And then we also recognize we have to reduce our impact. We're not going to take down the world with our carbon emissions, but we absolutely have to do better um, with our waste, with our disposal. Um, and we can certainly reduce and consume um, less and have a redesign of um, the, the kind of medical tools. Um, in Kyrgyzstan, um, for example, so we talk about climate change, also environmental degradation. One example is that, um, you know, adding this planetary health lens to our work means we'll be doing uh, additional kind of tool making um, and adapting what others have done. But in Kyrgyzstan, where you had a lot of mining um, now with landslides, with the changing climate, um, we want to understand better what about the toxic pollution. Um, and so we have some projects there and we're working with others like Terra Graphics International, this amazing remediation organization that helped us in um, when there was the lead poisoning outbreak in Zamfara where these children were dying and we didn't know why. So we really have to collaborate more. That's another big message we give. Um, uh, in Bangladesh, um, our colleagues wrote um, this piece and what's beautiful about the MSF brief is, you know, we are meteorologists, we're advocacy people, we're doctors, epidemiologists, um, community outreach people. So in Bangladesh, we know it's a highly climate impacted country and you have massive um, migration. You have 25% of the, 
of the population lives on coastal areas. You have uh, undernutrition, you have salinity intrusion into um, crops. And then MSF has a project with the Rohingya refugees in the south um, on the border of Myanmar. But we also are working on occupational health and urban health. And you have COVID has really um, been extremely challenging because some people were forced to go back home. But what the brief talks about is um, how you know we have uh, increased storms um, and and heat related issues. But we really have to get a grip on how we help people in urban settings because there's so many people moving to um, Dhaka and in other urban centers. Um, our colleagues, um, Sandra Smiley and Dr. Hassan Zahid in, in Pakistan, um, we know, and there was a mention of um, heat related um, illness and heat waves um, in Canada, but certainly in um, Pakistan, we, we're adapting our operations and figuring out how do we, how do we better uh, help people in with, with cooling? Um, how do we prepare for these um, heat related illnesses? And I'll note that between, um, in um, Pakistan in 2015, uh, there were 12,000 deaths. So we're just seeing many more deaths due to um, heat waves and temperatures above 40 degrees and morgues at capacity. We just have to um, still urge for mitigation, but we have to be able to respond better and help protect people. Um, our colleague Leo, who's a meteorologist, he's working on a meteorological and climate anticipation project. And it's really to better um, uh, anticipate, do hazard mapping, um, for Haiti, and we know that um, uh, we're, we're going to be doing this more in other countries as well. Um, so I really encourage you to look at our brief. I'll just share a couple more of the examples. The, um, in Niger, in August, massive flooding, flooding, unprecedented flooding at the same time as COVID. Um, so our colleagues um, um, from the West Africa Association, MSF's newest association, we're an associative movement. Um, they put the spotlight on what's happening there and you have, you know, displaced people, COVID, um, this water is going on to fields, you've got uh, uh, conflict, so really everything is converging um, with these floods and climate shocks and COVID. Um, this piece with epidemiologist friend, um, Francisco Luquero. So, in Malawi, Lake Chilwa is a hot spot in, um, in Malawi, a highly climate impacted country in um, Southern Africa. And you have these fisher communities and they, they, they need the water for um, fishing, for protein. Um, this is their business. And um, then you also have cholera, um, a massive cholera outbreak. And we know cholera is a climate sensitive disease. So I'm about to wrap up, but just to say what we did here was it's not only talking about the impacts and what people are facing, but how are we, how are we adapting? How are we working with the communities to um, make sure people get the, the healthcare they need? So we had to adapt the, the um, oral cholera vaccine. Normally it has to be refrigerated. When we think about vaccines, we're now thinking about the COVID vaccine, but how do we adapt for communities that don't have this refrigeration? So this was an important study about adapting our own response to cholera, which is exacerbated by climate change. And then lastly, you know, I talked about how are we going to do our work differently? How are we going to talk about it and share experiences? And that can help humanize the statistic, but also push for, push for changes and advocacy. And so we said we have to look at our own footprint. And something you said, um, Deborah, at a talk I was at at um, Daldala Institute for Global Health Research was in decarbonization, um, let's not recolonize. And I thought that was really important. But in MSF, what we recognize is we have to reduce our own footprint. Um, we have made a tool to measure our footprint, um, a carbon tool. We've used it in 12 countries. We've also made a waste tool. We're looking at our supply chain. And we're also looking at, you know, COVID forced us to do, do more local um, procurement for uh, recyclable PPE. And, um, and then we're really keeping our eye on, we, we, we need the vaccine to reach people who need it most. We need the price to be affordable but we also are really concerned about those, you know, billions of vaccine, the waste is something important to look at. So here are our key messages. Humanitarian needs outstrip the capacity. We have to acknowledge that we can't, you know, this is all in efforts because um, the, the humanitarian organizations need to work with community organizations and governments. 
we we're already underfunded and over overworked and just like the healthcare sector um but we need to we need to work together and um, fight climate change and environmental degradation governments retreating from the climate accord retreating from the who um even canada retreating from its obligations um to um give care not acceptable um xenophobia not acceptable um, we have to maximize our efficiency and do this kind of epidemiological and meteorological forecasting. And then this important one about learning and working with communities, build trust, empower, share information. And then lastly, we have to reduce our own footprint. So, um, you know, I took you on a bit of a tour, but just to really um, reiterate that um, we, the COVID and um, climate change crises, we, we, we really need to um, push uh, government, we really need to also um, recognize how we can improve our, our response. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Carol. I think it's really such a fascinating time in planetary health and global health. You know, we've seen MSF working for the first time here in Canada. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, there's this new conversation or at least much strengthened conversation around decolonizing global health broadly. And so we can see that you know, this model we had when I was a medical student where for some reason we thought we were going to be helpful if we went yeah. and did a mission for two weeks in a country where we'd yeah. never been before. Um, and I actually did that. It was, uh, I managed to get a spot on an MSF project in Nairobi and it became clear to me on the ward how absolutely inappropriate it was that I was there. And I actually went into one of the most memorable shame sweats of my entire life. I just burst into it was a full parasympathetic reaction and i'll never forget that but it wasn't clear to me how it all connected and now it's so clear that taking care of our part of the world and making sure that the way we interact with other countries in a fair way is probably the best thing we can do for Absolutely. global health and planetary health. So making sure we own our carbon footprint and we don't offshore our emissions as we decrease it here, making sure that our contributions to the Paris Climate Accord and the Green Climate Fund make sense based on our historical emissions and we're helping lower and middle income countries to adapt and to mitigate and making sure we don't sign trade deals that yep. disadvantage uh, middle and lower income countries because it's very easy for us to feel good when we've set up the system in a way that makes it impossible for other countries to get ahead and then you know offer charity and said i really think it's such an interesting time where you know rather than having high income countries middle income countries and lower income countries we we now are all citizens of the planet and we're yeah. citizens of the planet that are dealing with overlapping planetary health emergencies and really looking at how we can do that in the most equitable non-colonial way i think is uh makes it this a really it's a hinge moment in human history absolutely yeah and i think it's such a, a wonderful thing that we're we're here to discuss it i i've had uh goosebumps multiple times on this call and recently um as this conversation is coalescing um was honored to help write a new hippocratic oath for the anthropocene wow. that that asks people offers the opportunity to reset an intention to say I'm going to take care not only of people, but of the ecological systems that underpin it that really determine health and into the future. So we have, we're, we're at time, but we, we sort of agreed ahead of time, we might go a little over. So if uh, people need to drop off, we thank you so much for joining us. Um, if people want to stay on for another couple of minutes, I'll um, have a last uh, go round of the, the panelists to see if anybody saw a question in the chat that they really want to make sure they address. And um, we'll go from there. So let's see, uh, Dr. Collins, can, can you give us uh, your reaction to what you've heard? Um, thank you for that, Courtney. Um, just incredible uh, work on so many fronts. Uh, I was just um, going to write in my final notes and just to really say thank you to, to you, Courtney. I've learned a tremendous amount of you from you on our time uh, together on the CMA board. You've certainly enlightened and opened my eyes to many issues around climate and its impact on health. And it's good to see... Um, 
I mean, you're young, Courtney, but it's good to see too that this is carrying on uh, with uh, Claudel and F Finola and and so many others. So um, uh, it was wonderful to hear this tonight, and thank you for asking. Um, and I look forward to watching this um, and participating and poking CMA along uh, in whatever way we can to uh, to assist in this area. So thanks very much. Well, thank you. And I have to say that having the support of the CMA presidents in this is absolutely key. Um, it uh, felt like a very lonely uh, place to be working for a long time, and it feels a lot less lonely now. And uh, we know that the solidarity and the collegiality and just moving it into the mainstream is what's going to let us get this done at scale. So it warms my heart so much to uh, have the CMA be so increasingly supportive. It's uh, absolutely necessary. And uh, from having been on the board for a little while now, the, the CMA staff are incredible. They're some of the most capable professionals that I've ever worked with. And so having that team on this case, I'm, it makes me very excited. So thank you. Um, let's move to uh, Claudel. Claudel, anything? What would what would you? Yeah, say? I, I just want to highlight that there there has been a couple of questions um, that were asked during the presentations, and uh, Courtney Finola and I have um, typed down some answers. So if if we haven't answered your question directly uh, on this call, is probably because we've written um, we've written it down in the Q and A uh, section, um, and and just I think most of us at least um, I know Courtney Finla and I are quite active on Twitter so if you want to continue that conversation we'd be happy to to do it over um, social media uh, we need we need amplifying votes voices and I think some people in the chat highlighted how it was good to see some doctors taking um, a stand on, 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 on climate change but also having a social and equity lens and just want to say well it, it's good to have um, several voices carrying that very important message so um, if you're willing to rely either the brief or some of the media um, outlets that we've um, on, on, in your own networks, um, this is very helpful to just, you know, ensuring that your colleagues are um, joining the conversation as well. Um, so I would invite you, I mean, The Lancet is a, in an internationally renowned medical journal. So if you have, if you're looking for something to present at a journal club and I advise this is a very good read, uh, but it's good that if we, if we are able to, to get it, um, to talk about it in our own networks, um, that will help us as well. Perfect. Thanks so much, Claudel. And yeah, thanks for just being such an incredible leader in this space uh, for, for really quite a while now. Um, Dr. Hackett, what what would uh, you like to say? Thanks, Courtney. I'm just finishing, you know, madly typing up answers in the chat. I just am so um, happy to see the number of people and the number of people engaged in discussions and questions um, tonight and throughout the last months, weeks, and moving forward. It's really, it's how we will do all of this. It's together. Um, I... I think there were some really good questions um, that we hopefully answered adequately um, in the Q and A. Um, one of the questions um, was about further action and how do we get the public and policymakers to implement and take note of these um, these topics and recommendations. I think that's what I wanted to talk about now, just because really that is that is the that is the ultimate goal. Is it's great that we have so many people in healthcare and in other fields who are um, recognizing these issues. So, so what now? Um, and I think there's many different things you can do. You can talk to your, your patients, your colleagues, your families, you know, even just getting people to think about that when it, when it comes up in context, for example, when you see an example of dehydration from extreme heat or the example of the asthma um, exacerbation related to, to pollutants, Things, these are opportunities to have those moments um, that can make a change. But more broadly, um, maybe consider talking to your elected officials. I think we all underestimate our voice. All of us have a voice and we all have the ability to, to, to use it, whether that's from you know, arranging a meeting to engaging on social media, sending an email, um, talking to people that, that you come across in your day-to-day -day life. I think it, it's a responsibility that that 
we can all take and that will slowly move us in that just and sustainable recovery direction. So that's my last thing I wanted to say. Yeah, thanks. That's certainly something uh, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives did a really interesting study where they audited all of the visits to federal decision makers and counted up how many were taken by the fossil fuel industry versus nonprofits and the fossil fuel fuel industry won by a factor of at least five. So I figure we need to be getting about five times as many meetings uh, as we currently are, as we recently have with policymakers on this topic, if we want to be having anywhere close to the level of influence that uh, we need. And so I would encourage everybody to make a date with your MP, bring your kid, um, because it's, you know, we, we know that the communications evidence uh, says that uh, presenting climate change in terms of the health of a child is the best way to motivate action across policymakers. And it's certainly a lot more difficult to say no to uh, measures that benefit the next generation when, when there's a cute one sitting there in front of you. So I would uh, encourage that. Um, Dr. McGregor, what would you like to contribute? I think I, I, I really appreciate what, what everyone has said and I've been following a little bit on, on the q and I think, um, some of the some of the comments related. What can we do? How can, how can we keep the advocacy? And I just wanted to just point out that um, AFN we're working on the climate change strategy for First Nations that hopefully can be um, part of advocacy. Um, also working on an Indigenous resilience report. Um, really trying to frame that also within Indigenous knowledge. What does that look like? How to how can it contribute to these broader conversations? I think one thing that really excited me about tonight's conversation. Um, and the lens that, uh, that that Carol brought forward is looking at looking at climate um, climate health, also planetary health, like human health, from um, a justice equity lens, but also a planetary health lens. And that's a more holistic way of looking at it. So when I think about um, the priorities and concerns and experiences of Indigenous peoples in this conversation, I see I see a lot of overlap where we could. Like there's just more voice and just more advocacy to help put like a really different sort of perspective out there. So when we have the meetings that we we have the evidence and the experiences to be able to um, to be able to bring that forward. I think that's um, I think that's really important because it means that we're going to start diagnosing, uh, for lack of a better word, the 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 climate change impacts um, in a different way when we look at it holistically from those different lens, and then that'll generate different kind of solutions as opposed to the same old, which doesn't, which is not working um, at all. So that's sort of what I'm excited about that we're starting to have these conversations. There's more and more people who who can push for that kind of advocacy and have those five times more meetings that we need to have to uh, to catch up. So I, I want to thank everyone for. Um, for getting me to think about these kind of things and giving me a bit of hope that we there, there's a lot we have in common. So, Jimmy Gwetch. Perfect. That's uh, yeah, I, I agree. These uh, and and we just what I love about this work is you stay on the the steep part of the learning curve, and I just find it so fascinating and meet so many incredible people. It's just uh, such enriching work. I love it. Um, Carol, what you're you're gonna bring us home, Carol? What what would you like to leave us with? Oh, not Anne. Okay, thank you. Um, I I want to thank. I saw at one stage there were 168, probably more at one stage. But thank you for being together in this really strange and you know difficult, but also hopeful somehow time. And and thank you for this evening. I want to leave with this sense of. Um, solidarity and that every action matters within your sphere of influence. I woke up at 4.30 to a.m. to um, be on a call with colleagues from our South Asia um, Association. We had Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, and it was just somehow COVID has, um, you know, brought um, birds that we haven't seen before to our city, um, but also it's democratized and forced our organization to, to change. And what was great about uh, um, this, this call with colleagues about is we talked about how we need to treat each other better and the planet better and um, yeah I'm just really grateful. Um, it's an upside down time but um, like the Lancet said it's a great opportunity that Claudel said so um, yeah I'm really grateful that we were able to be here uh, together and see the interrelationships between the Canadian brief and um, the humanitarian brief. 
Yeah, it's fantastic. Thank you so much uh, to everyone for joining us. Uh, let's uh, take advantage of this hinge moment in human history to take a pause, take a breath, reset our intentions, and make a whole bunch of good mischief together because we know that coming together feels good. And we also know from the psychological literature that getting stuff done together feels even better. It's empowering. And I frankly can't think of a better way to live a life. So thank you for spending the last uh, hour and a half of your life with us. And we look forward to all the work we're going to do together in the years to come. Masicho from uh, Denny Territory. Thanks everybody, merci. Good night everybody, thank you. Take care.